you're essentially giving people the tools to go and spend their time to ultimately build your company, um, which is super helpful. And so all that to say, it doesn't have to be a paid marketing approach. It could 100% be a free channel. Welcome to Uptech Report. This is our Founders Journey series. Uptech Report is sponsored by TerraLeap. Learn how to leverage the power of video at TerraLeap.io. Today, I am joined by my guest, Renji Bajoy, who's based in Austin, Texas. He's the founder and CEO of Immersed. Now, this is part two of our discussion. Uh, go back and listen to part one, where we heard more about how they're actually partnering with Microsoft, Facebook, and HTC to build VR offices. How cool that is. And I'm psyched now to hear more, though, Renji, your story, like how do you got to where you are today? Tell, take me back. Like, were, were you just always into technology and just like, uh, I, I want to be in this space? Uh, so, no, it's an interesting um, story. So, I, well, as a kid growing up, I mean, low income family, we didn't, couldn't afford much of anything. Um, my parents were immigrants who came straight from India, zero dollars in their pocket. They came to this country without anything. And so they really had to kind of build from the ground up. We did live in a pretty uh, low income area in New York City. And, and even that was extremely expensive. A lot of gang activity was just extremely just like unsafe. And so uh, my parents, they then ended up moving us to a suburb in Georgia because they had some siblings who had moved down there and realized, oh, you can get a five bedroom home for a third of the price of a house in New York. And so uh, we ended up moving to the suburbs of Georgia um, and I ended up, go, I guess, kind of growing up there playing with kids uh, in the cul-de-sac, you know, just kind of open land, whatever. Um, and then I moved into the city for um, undergrad. So Emory, I went there, I went to Emory for undergrad uh, and then Georgia Tech for grad school. But for undergrad, I was actually pre-med. I was not in tech. I mean, I was, I, 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 I took all. all of my pre-med classes. I no, yeah, I, I took uh, my MCATs. I applied to med schools. I was waiting to hear back from med schools, but I also did do <laughs> math and computer science for myself, specifically math. So I knew I was really good at math um, and they forced you to take one Java class. And so uh, it turns out, I found out that I was good at coding. I didn't know I was good at coding. I was kind of late because my first Java class, I was 20 years old. And so like most coders who are, you know, Mark Zuckerberg's been coding since like eight, eight years old, right? Elon Musk, same thing. And for me, you know, here's me as like, you know, two years into being an adult, and I just come across what the heck coding is. Um, but I guess as I look back in my past, there are ways that like my logical thinking um, was was sort of, uh, I guess, somewhat of a gifting without me realizing it. I, you know, I, growing up, I played Halo. I was, um, as a 12 year old kid, I just, I just never lost. It was nuts. Like I would play in all of the local tournaments and I was playing against these, you know, 25 year old kids and, you know, I'm literally half their age. Um, but here's this like little 12 year old Renji who's, crushing everyone at the tournament. I had never been in a tournament where the finals weren't 25 to zero with me winning. Like every single time, every second place yeah, person. It just came natural to, to me. you. Yeah, like I think that for me, I mean, number one, I played a lot, but it was mainly because I think sort of uh, strategy, like teamwork, those are things that, you know, obviously translate to my work today. Um, but I know that, you no, know, like I, you have to make certain sacrifices here and there just to win uh, at the end, the end goal, like things like, oh, like I really, really uh, want the rocket launcher, but uh, I know that they might see me. So, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll lay off the rocket launcher for a second. Yes, they might go get it, but I have the sniper here. And so although they can blow me up with one shot, I know that if I have better aim, I could hit them first. So, you know, the little like, it's like, yeah, it was a sacrifice for me to not pick up the rocket launcher, but the end goal is to get the kill, right? So at the end of the day, it's like, okay, well, maybe I won't get the rocket launcher I want, but you, you learn how to not go for certain like fool's gold or whatever. And instead, just reach the end goal, if that makes sense. Reggie, you're, paint, you're painting a picture here now uh, for, for uh, uh, kid <laughs> gamers that, that eventually the skills that they learn gaming can help them uh, d uh, oh, lead their own startup 100%, later. A hundred percent. So like for me, I didn't realize that um, getting deep into gaming was kind of the starter for me to uh, become a lot more tech savvy. So in undergrad, yeah, I mean. 20 year old kid learning how to, or 20 year old adult learning how to uh, code for the first time. Turns out I was actually pretty good at it. And so as I was waiting to hear back from uh, med schools, it was like a nine month waiting cycle. And I was just like, well, I'm not gonna sit here and do nothing. So, you know, cause I had already graduated at that point from undergrad. So I was like, let me just start applying as a software engineer. And I went into those uh, interviews going uh, to them saying, hey, look, I don't have any experience. I took like three Java classes, but uh, what I can say is 
if I don't learn this job within the first two or three months and do better than the people who you have hired here right now, you can fire me. <laughs> and like, I know it's going it. in crazy, yeah, going crazy bull. I guess it's de risky from them. They're like, yeah, you gave me license to fire you. So you better do a great job. And so for me, I, like, it doesn't mean I just was handed the job. It means I had to prove myself. And I think that I really love the, the, the process. I love the challenge. Um, but it was very clear that after just, you know, those two or three months, I realized, man, I could really create stuff that other people could use. Um, I realized I just, I don't know if I ever wanted to go to med school. And so I just like, I started hearing back from med schools and I, you could tell which ones I got into. I didn't open them because I knew I'd be tempted to go just because uh, I've been training for, for so long, but I, you, you could kind of tell which ones you got into because it's a thicker packet or whatever, but I just took all of them. I just threw it in the trash. My parents were so angry at me because again, coming from a low income family and like their son becoming a doctor or I was specifically focused on like neurosurgery or cardiothoracic surgery. And so like for them, they loved that story and they loved, you know, the fact that they wouldn't have to worry about money that much. Um, but for me, I was, and you know, they're, you know, I was like, no, but I think I want to go be a coder. And they're like, the heck, <laughs> like, no, don't waste your time. And so, um, obviously uh, they were extremely upset with me today. They're happy, but back then they were so angry that I didn't go and, uh, go the, the med school route. But anyways, as a software engineer, I ended up climbing the software engineering ladder very rapidly. Um, I think by the, so by the time I was, I guess, 22, turning 23, so about the age of 23 years old. So about 18 months out of graduating from undergrad, um, I hit somewhat of a ceiling in my career. Cause I'd sort of gone from job to job, to job, to job, kind of like kind of climbing the ranks. Like I would go entry level here to uh, mid-level elsewhere, to a senior elsewhere, to a lead architect elsewhere. And was sort of, because after about three to six, I would say more like six ish months at each job, I started getting bored and my managers would say things like, Oh, Hey, like we can't give you more responsibility because we have like annual reviews. Um, but you know, we'll, we'll talk in a year. And I'm like, in a year, I don't know if I'll be alive. Like, you know, like I have to move now. And so these LinkedIn recruiters would just spam you. And so I'd always respond to all the LinkedIn recruiters saying, yeah, I mean, and I would always just at least like entertain, okay, what would it look like for me to work where elsewhere at a higher position? And so going from, and I never asked for more money. I only asked for more responsibility. And so, um, but fortunately, obviously I, being a lead software architect at my last job when I was 23, um, I was getting paid a lot and I was paying like 170 bucks for rent, <clears throat> 170 bucks for rent. Cause I was in a house with 10 other dudes. And so like, we're just splitting up rent like crazy. And so I got to save a lot of money and little did I know that would prepare me really well for going two years without a single paycheck in order to start immersed. So you, you, you jump in the ladder here and there, which is actually, you're actually pay, is showing a way for others, kid gamers that say, Hey, you can uh, climb the ladder as a coder and then quickly be able to say, you're going to start your own venture. Was it simply as that you just suddenly, okay, I, I'm ready now. I, I want to do my own thing. Was it just, just that, uh, it, was, that it was a lot of not being, it was a lot of not being content with my previous jobs, meaning <clears throat> I was working on products that they thought was awesome, but I didn't really like it. it example. So the last job that I quit, um, it was, it was the day after our honeymoon. And so I just like, uh, my wife was like, what the heck? And like her family was like, I, you just got married and now you're going to quit your job. <laughs> and so it was kind of, uh, it was kind of just not good timing from their perspective, but deliberately they knew I had a pretty big nest egg at the time. But, um, what I'd realized at my previous jobs was I just didn't want to work on time waster apps, meaning like I was most recently a lead software architect for CNN, uh, working on greatbigstory.com. And we got to growth hack that. So, you know, 3 million followers. It was kind of like a, an internal startup that was backed by CNN because they were trying to create a like short three to five minute documentary clip, like a repository for these millennials to actually engage with CNN on some level. <clears throat> Cause CNN's historically, you know, 40, 50, 60, 70 year old people who watch their, um, content. And so, I, yeah, it was a very addicting application. Cool. And had 3 million followers within two months, but I just don't want to work on time with time waste apps the rest of my life. So ended up jumping ship and then focusing on, uh, a ultimately a PhD at Georgia tech in, uh, computer vision and, sh and machine learning. But, um, that also was taking forever. And so, uh, it, after about two and a half years, I quit that and just sort of settled for the masters and then decided to actually start building immersed. Gotcha. It, it sounds like you, you have this insatiable desire to keep moving forward and, and you start to, uh, yeah. to lose patience if, if it takes too long. He's just like, I gotta, I gotta push more. I gotta push more. For, yeah. For well, I'm, I'm okay with, well, I, what I will say is I'm okay with if something takes a long time, but not for no reason. Right. Meaning if the PhD is taking forever, just because the research professor is like, eh, yeah, I just want you to work here longer. It's like, that's dumb. <laughs> right. So arbitrary. And then working at, uh, for example, these different jobs as a software engineer, 
if they just have arbitrary annual reviews, especially when someone has proven that they can do a better job even than their managers, I just don't know why this is not a meritocracy and why they can't incentivize or incentivize people to just want to be uh, more and more, uh, I guess, elite or for lack of better terms, uh, than they were previously, right? Like, or at least, at least just refine in their skills and just do better and better and better. Because if it's moving the business forward, why wouldn't you incentivize that? So all that to say, like, even in the startup world, I can't force the market to want my product. But as long as I'm not getting in the way or my no one on my team or our users or whatever, like are getting in the way of this progressing and moving forward, like th that's totally fine. Like I do understand things do take time, but um, it was just, I had noticed that in the world that we I had lived in and sort of kind of this cookie cutter, like box sort of world that you've been placed in, there are just so many arbitrary type things uh, or at least arbitrary for you. Meaning, yes, I'm sure there are reasons why companies have annual reviews because they're trying to do this at scale. Um, they don't know how this doesn't work for every employee, but that shows that I just wasn't made for corporate America, right? It shows that I was a very clear misfit. Um, it may, might be arbitrary for me, but it wasn't arbitrary for the other nine to five employees who are totally fine. They have like a 40-year life plan. I don't. I might die next year. I don't know. And this is why I'm constantly moving fast until I'm called home, right? So <laughs> I, I love it. Now, the this this energy leads you towards starting Immerse. Now, um, looking backwards, the last four years, you, you've actually raised, I think you said, up over about $12 million over the last four years. Yeah. Is that correct? Yeah. Um, now, well, see, yeah. So uh, the first two years is about like a million and a half. Yeah. And then after that, well, sorry, the first you know, like year and a half, it was, it was nothing. Um, but then, yeah, I think after that, it was like uh, a million. And then last year, we raised $3 million, And then this year, we raised $8 million. So that first year and a half, that was bootstrapped? That was just you just figuring out? Yeah, it was just sa savings. I, I was the angel investor. Yeah. <laughs> so what was the was the the motivator or indicator for you to then, all right, now I gotta I gotta raise some money? Yeah. Um when my team when it was very clear I needed to hire a team that I could do everything. Um for me in the early days of Immerse, like every um piece of the core technology that we had built in the early days was was me. I had built the agent that was living on the Mac. Uh, the operating system. And then I also built the initial Unity application that run, ran on the headset. And that was kind of our base case. Um, and I built a, I started using sort of different versions of streaming technology. I had to tweak it for our use case um, to get just the prototype working. And as soon as I proved, hey, like this is, and, and by the way, like Immerse was the first uh, company in the world to ever stream a computer screen into VR wirelessly. Um, there were other computer uh, competition or uh, competitors that had done it wired but they just it, it just never happened wirelessly until we kind of focused on it because for me again i was so focused on do people want to be tethered to a desk like you want a wire to your head like no no one wants that um i want to be free and i want to move as needed and so um i just wanted to kind of in, invent what that was we did have patents on that as well which is really cool um but that being said i realized i couldn't build everything and i couldn't build it fast enough um this is you know being early in vr um or at least from a traction standpoint or adoption standpoint, uh, you're having to build a lot of the technology that just doesn't exist. Um, and so if you think about people who build on uh, build websites and mobile apps and stuff, a lot of the underlying core technology on your computer or on your phone, a lot of it's built, built already by other people. And so you're just building on top of it. But for us in VR, I mean, yes, there are headsets that kind of work and then you have, uh, but, but I mean, that's about it. And now you're having to build all the other kind of unnecessary quote unquote technology that's not even relevant to really what your high level value proposition is just to get certain things to just work. And so I had to build some sort of uh, streaming technology that just worked for our use case, right? I had to build some virtual display stuff. And so all that to say, like, uh, I guess we, the pieces weren't there that people take for granted in the web and mobile world. A lot of these pieces, pieces are there for you back then. That just wasn't the case. You, you bring the, to light the fact that the building for VR is still somewhat of a, a the wild west, where if you want to just build an app, yeah. that's okay, no problem. It's like going down to the, the, yeah. the corner but, store. Yeah, but think about yeah, but, but think about building like um, like a web app or a uh, mobile app, but you have to build the internet first. It's like, am I really going to build the internet first in order to make uh, you know Uber or Lyft or whatever? It's like that would really suck if you had to build the internet first. Um, but and not saying that we I'm, I built the internet. What I'm saying is there are a lot of uh, technologies that make, and that's kind of why we have such a deep te technological moat is because a lot of this stuff is just not open, uh, open box, whatever. Like you can't just go get it from wherever off the shelf. 
you have to build a lot of this stuff from the ground up. And this is four years in the making. And so um, I think that as I realized that I couldn't just do all of this in order to move as fast as I wanted to from a speed standpoint, or from a traction standpoint, I had to start hiring other people and in order to do that. Uh, I couldn't just bootstrap everything forever. I had to go uh, find outside capital. Now, uh, what being able to to know your your target market and and a good product design that does help in in raising the funds and having the vision. Okay, this is who we're targeting. And we talked in the last episode that you decided on uh, engineers and coders yourselves, basically. Like we're going to just build a product for them. And your mentality though has always been kind of like a Slack way where it'd be B to C to the person, but to eventually get back to the enterprise. Is that correct? Yep. Yeah. So yeah, we call it the B to C to B approach, right? So we actually ran an experiment uh, as far as me doing B2B sales. And by the way, like I did uh, during undergrad do uh, sales. And so I, that's why I um, am not just like a crazy, socially awkward, like coder or whatever. Like I can have a conversation and I could pitch yeah. decently well, partly because I, you know, for fundraising, for product, whatever, uh, partly because, yeah, I had that awesome sales job in undergrad that is not easy, but I think that everyone should have a sales job at some point. It really develops you in a lot of ways. Um, it helps you kind of learn about, uh, yeah, how do you not just get a participation medal, but in order to like pay your, uh, for your meals, you have to actually perform. <laughs> right. And so, uh, when we, anyways, bring it back to the, uh, the whole topic, um, as I don't know, like as I, um, started doing this experiment between B to B versus B to C to B, meaning just put an app on the store or um, get eyeballs onto your product and see if they could upsell this to their managers. I mean, hands down, a hundred to one, like a hundred x more effective than me doing B to B sales. Because think about it, even just from a logical, in hindsight, it's logical. Um, meaning, me taking a headset, or first off, let me take us back even before that, prospecting, finding who the heck would even want to talk about this, uh, then getting the meeting then actually bringing the headset to demo that, you know, to, to, to figure out if I can even get it to them, then convincing them that I'm not biased towards my own product. Clearly I am. Uh, and ultimately giving them a very candid, clear, objective, um, a beneficial review of my product and, and ultimately pitching to them, Hey, you should buy this thing because this is a need that you have maybe. And so, uh, ultimately getting kind of all through those hoops and then them having to, once they're convinced, all right, getting them to figure out who they need to kind of bring it to, uh, in their chain of command as well, getting corporate approval on stuff, just so many like, uh, hoops to jump through. But then when you think about the B to C to B approach on the flip side, the champion internally already found the product on their own. They already found the value. Uh, they are now pitching it to their manager who already knows that they don't work for a That person doesn't work for a merge. They work for their company. So they're inherently unbiased. And from there, they already know who in the chain of command is the decision maker, right? They don't need, I don't need to go find out who that is, but they do. And so then you have that at scale, they're prospecting on their own because they are the eyeballs who are um, already looking at your application, already using it, right? So this is really just like, we're talking, um, hey, are, do I want to push a boulder up a hill or do I want to just like throw a boulder off the edge of uh, Mount Everest? Like I would pick Mount Everest. <laughs> just because like gravity will do all the work just throw it off the edge of mount everest and it will freaking it'll it'll move if my goal is to move this boulder as far as possible i would pick the the gravity side as opposed to me being the one to make this happen if that makes sense so all that to say like i think that uh probably a, probably a lot more companies could do a much better job at um honestly uh, at, at being able to get a lot more exposure get a lot more leads coming in if they at least uh, ran an experiment between a B2B approach versus B2C to B, you know, granted it sort of depends on your space. If you're in like healthcare or gov tech or whatever, it might be a little bit different, but what it, it, it realized though, all these people who work at these places, I mean, Facebook does have like 2 billion users, right? So someone's eyeballs are using Facebook and someone's going to eventually come across it. Someone knows someone who works at an army base or, or works at a hospital or whatever. And so I wonder if people, if they were to just all these B2B companies, if they were to even just try brainstorming, what could a B to C to B strategy look like? I wonder if they could grow 10x yeah, in a much, uh, I guess, lower lift sort of way. For this uh, B to C to B uh, mentality, what tactics have you found to work to get the attention? Because in order to get to the event and B, you still need to get a ton, a ton of consumers in order to make that ratio yeah. work. So what tactics have 100%. you found work for marketing? Yeah. So uh, from a marketing standpoint, I think people are too quick to use Facebook ads. I'll just be real. Like I'm not saying that I'm, all I'm saying is there is a way to get to them. Um, as far as how scrappy you can be, it just sort of depends. Right. So for us, for example, um, it's really weird and random. I didn't expect this at the time. 
Um, but especially back then, but Reddit was a huge source of eyeballs for me and it was free. I just used Reddit. I would post, um, to these different, like these different, like VR Reddit channels that I didn't know really even existed. It was really just a crazy, crazy, like out of all the early adopter VR nerds, it was like a small subset of VR nerds who were like crazy passionate, like, Hey, like we're already in the Oasis, you know, back in 2016, it's like, uh, no, we're not <laughs> like, they're kind of psycho. Right. And so, but when I showed my product to them, they would go nuts and post it all over on the internet on my behalf. And so they would, and so essentially you're, you're over time building a small kind of army that just does all of this for you. They just are so passionate about the product that you've built that they will go on Twitter. They will go on Facebook. They'll go on Instagram, wherever they'll go. And we have people who posted uh, immersive videos on TikTok, And I'm like, isn't mainly like eight year old kids that are on there, but like people are posting stuff on TikTok of them working in VR or whatever. And so now we're just getting a ton of users come from TikTok. Too. It's so, so random, but you're essentially giving people the tools to go and spend their time to ultimately build your company, um, which is super helpful. And so all that to say, it doesn't have to be a paid marketing approach. It could hundred percent be a free channel. You just have to go out there and experiment and find who are the people uh, who could very well really uh, expand your message and people who are very well networked, right? Reddit is a huge platform that is uh, slept on. People don't think about Reddit very often. Um, when it comes to Facebook, I think it's kind of the easy way out. I appreciate that 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 whole mentality of find those 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 who are just crazy about that area, get them to be yeah. your champions to move it on. Now, one piece, okay, is funding, another piece is marketing it, but you've already stated earlier, to truly grow the grow this, you needed a team, a good team, the right yeah. team, a talented team. What would you yeah. say uh, has been some of your biggest lessons learned in growing the team? Yeah, uh, number one, uh, I would say is don't sacrifice on who you hire, right? Don't make a hire just because you're desperate for someone to code something, um, just because you're trying to hit deadlines. Instead, you could make a wrong hire who ends up being someone who you have to part ways with longer term. And some people don't even know how to part ways with people also. You mentioned that that Sorry. you you are you're, are super focused on on just the best people. How do you find the best people? Like yeah. if you if you're not going to sacrifice, where are you going? How are you finding these people? Yeah, so it's 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 pretty crazy, but um, a lot of the stuff that we do is very counterintuitive. You almost have to find the people who you're you're forced to try to un or to, to unsell them on your company, and they will bust down the doors to get into your company regardless, right? So what I mean by that is. Um, very intentionally, we have a very low salary cap. We don't pay crap from a salary standpoint. Uh, we are, however, generous on the equity side. We want people who truly believe in this company. Um, and if they don't believe in this company to the point where they're willing to make large salary um, sacrifices, then they probably shouldn't be at your company. They're probably not going to be there when crap hits the fan and you need someone to be there in the middle of the night to help take care of this baby that is your startup, right? Um, I think that people who um, end up just sort of, you know, trying to show off, Oh, we have these benefits and blah, blah. It's like, you're already, you're, you're bringing them to your startup for the wrong reasons. Your startup should be inherently attractive to these employees to start with. Um, if they're coming here for the benefits, like for the salary or for table tennis or whatever, they're not coming for the startup. They're coming for the wrong reasons. And so that being said, we had a very, uh, unattractive compensation package from a, uh, salary standpoint. The only thing that was attractive was equity. You know, however, I wasn't making people co-founders. I was giving them generous early hire equity though. Um, and so what that meant was people who, and, and again, that doesn't mean I'm looking for only people who desperately want to work at Immerse. I'm looking for people who desperately want to work at Immerse and have already have a crazy successful proven track record, right? So out of the subset of people who really, really want to, to work at Immerse with, based on me having hopefully done a good job, building a great, attractive, big vision to begin with and executed on that vision to start with, um, the, the hope is that uh, out of all those people who really want to work at Immerse, you can find that small subset of people. And yes, it might be 400 interviews before you find the one. Once you do find the one, um, these are people who, for example, um, people on our team were getting paid between 200 to 500K at their previous jobs but they've gotten to a point where they're like, eh, the money's cool, but I'm just not content at Google or Microsoft or uh, Apple or whatever. whatever. Um, and they're like, I just want to work on this startup and I, and I want to be in the VR space and I wish it was something more practical like productivity. And it's like, you find these people who are already thinking this somewhere on earth. Now you just need to somehow meet. And so the question is, how do you find those people? You find people who are incentivized by equity, not by salary. They will be uh, a person who will be there in the middle of the night. They won't just be a hired nine to five hand uh, they would be someone who are actually like co-founder type people who will be there through thinking, thinking thin. What's so crazy is back in 2019, uh, we actually ran out of money. 
And it took me six additional months to find capital. And by the beginning of the six months, I went to my team and said, hey, look, we ran out of money. You guys are free to go and find jobs if you want. And seven out of seven at the time said, we're not going anywhere. We're sitting right here until you get this thing funded. And they just continued coding. They started, they kept working as if they're getting paid. Um, and what was cool was, um, so number one, that brought me to tears. <laughs> number two, um, it, it, I realized how dedicated my team was. I realized that the immersive is not going to fail because we run out of money. Like if you're able to build a company that doesn't fail when it runs out of money, you build something that people don't build. Like that just doesn't happen. Uh, when startups usually fail when, when, when money runs out of the bank or money, there's no more money in the bank. So anyways, ended up getting this thing funded and, uh, people on the team, they, they like stuck around, if anything, got them even more passionate about what we were building. So all I have to say, like, if you're able to build something so attractive and build relationships with people who are the top engineers in the world, who are okay with an 80% pay cut to work at a company that doesn't pay them crap, but they are sure that this is going to be the company that is going to be the next Google or Apple or whatever. Uh, I mean, you're going to find the people who are going to help you build that next Google or Apple or whatever. So. As, as a uh, as a uh, single founder, but yet not by yourself, it's it's. I can definitely tell your your presence, your energy seems to just want to pull people along. And, I, and I, we could probably talk for 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 another half hour on this, but I'm going to close with 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 this last question here. Um, as a as a leader, how are you continuing to grow? What books, audio books, podcasts are you listening to, reading, and, and can recommend? Yeah. Um, I think the, so two things. So, um, well, I can recommend podcasts that I really loved. I loved Masters of Scale with Reed Hoffman. Um, I loved Naval um, Ravi, Ravi Kant, uh, I think I say his last name, uh, Naval, just Twitter, N-A-V-A-L, um, his podcast, which is just straight information, which is so effective. Um, sometimes I listen to Joe Rogan stuff, but mainly it's the tech people, the tech focus people on Joe Rogan stuff. Um, but I think the things that sharpened me the most for startups <clears throat> are going to be, um, yeah, like I listen to a lot of Y Combinator lectures, uh, at Stanford on YouTube that are recorded on YouTube. Um, those have been probably one of the most, some of the most effective things for, uh, me and my team, you know, I have a kind of a, a list of books right here that kind of you know, hooked, uh, lean, lean startup, uh, ready player two, that's more inspiration. Um, and, and like, there's other books out there that have also been helpful, but I think for me, like if you surround yourself with the world's most brilliant people. I mean, you can't help but to constantly sharpen each other. Um, these are people who also soak in information. They don't even have to necessarily be on your team. They could just be other founders of other companies who you're just sort of networked with. So I think it's so important to have really strong relationships. So awesome, man. Thank you so much, Randy, for, for your time. This has been uh, very enjoyable to hear the journey. For those who want to hear more about Immerse, go back and listen to part one of our discussion, but you can also go to immersed.com. And we never even got a chance to talk about you actually buying the domain. We'll have to do more another interview later because that, that, that's a whole story yeah. um, too. But yeah. thank you again, Renji. It's good to have you on, man. Hey, thanks so much. So glad to be here. And we'll see you guys on the next episode of UpTech Report. Have you seen a company using AI, machine learning, or other technology to transform the way we live, work, and do business? Go to uptechreport.com and let us know.